Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. We are here to talk about the power of immersion today. First, I would like to ask you a question. Who has already tried virtual reality in the room? Can you raise your hands? A lot. Okay. Virtual reality is a new window over our world. It's a new tool. It means it's a new hope. But virtual reality is not that new of a technology. It arrives from a distant age, if I can say. It was back in 1962. The first dispositive was from Morton Eilig, the Sensorama. And it was um, an augmented virtual reality. It was not 360 video yet, but it was augmented because you had wind, motion, you had aromas as well and vibrations that came with it. And Morton proposed five films and among them a little bicycle trip through Brooking. And just for your information, this, this machina still work, was still working 30 years later. After we go to 1968 with Ivan Sutherland from the MIT, he created the Sword of Damocles, and you can tell by the look of the dispositive, the look of the headset, why it's called the Sword of Damocles. And what you would be able to see in this one, in 360, this one, it was very pixelized, very simple forms and geometry. Then we go to the 90s. Maybe the early tech adopters in the room, I've seen this one before. It is the Virtual Boy Nintendo. Who, I've seen this before, maybe one of you. Have you tried this? Someone tried this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So what you would see in this one is this quality of games. It was immersive, it was fun, but it was getting you quite sick. And this is the reason why it didn't work at the time. Plus, this is only my expectation because I didn't have one at home. But I'd say that you could have pretty neck pain after playing to the virtual boy. Today, virtual reality looks much more like this. This is Google Earth VR. This is images from satellites, high resolution, and you can walk through them in virtual reality using HTC Vive. It is used today in scientific trials to study which is called the overview effect. And the overview effect is something that is exclusive. Um, it's an experience that was exclusive for our fellow astronauts. It's the feeling the first time you have, when the first time you go to space and you see the little planet, the little blue dot from the outside. We are able to immerse people in virtual environments more than ever. High resolution, high fidelity in other sensory feedbacks. This is a game in which you have to walk um, on, from heights and some people have bad reaction playing it because vertigo gets real. And we have seen people screaming, fainting, going on the floor, falling in virtual reality. Why? Just because your system says to you, okay, you are in danger. You are in danger because it's high and if you fall, maybe you're gonna die. But why? Why do we get caught? Because we know that a few seconds ago, someone put a headset on our heads. So why do we get caught? Every second, one third of the brain is hacked by visual information. It means that every second, one third of your brain is occupied totally by your eyes and what goes through it. So it leaves not much room for the rest. The brain didn't evolve to resist virtual reality, which gives this technology interesting applications for example, distraction therapy. This is a case that goes back in 1996. What you see here 
He's a patient who has been severely, severely burnt, and we have to change his bandages. This operation is highly, highly painful. Why? Because when you are severely burnt, what happens is that every day a thin, a thin um, part of your skin is going to grow back and it's going to attach to the bandages. So every day when we have to change the bandages, we're going to scratch off your arms, this skin. So it's very painful and we used to use the best, um, um, the best morphine we had to treat this pain. But what we wanted to try is say, okay, if we can hack the brain with virtual reality, maybe we can hack the pain. Because after all, pain is only an information, right? So what they did is they tried without VR and with VR. And what you can see is that yellow is the greatest pain you can feel. And that in virtual reality, the pain disappears. And virtual reality has been proven to be more effective than morphine in this case. Which is interesting, why? Because you can see this is no world. So the world they use for people to be immersed during this operation. And it's not high quality. You can see snowballs, it is very pixelized. But it's enough for the persons to just forget about the pain. Here, I want to show you another thing we learned with VR. It's the more you give coherence to your virtual environment, the more the brain is trapped. It can reveal its potential. This is a paraplegic patient who lost the use of his legs, and he was not supposed to walk again. So what scientists did is that they put him into virtual reality, and they listened to the part of the brain, the motor part of the brain, that were linked to the limb. Because when you lose the use of your limbs, the part of the brain that were controlling the limbs does not disappear overnight. So you can still listen to it. And we put an EEG headset on the head of this person to listen to the command of the brain. And when the brain was saying, I'm walking, the virtual limbs were walking. And after one year of this exercise, the person that were not supposed to walk again, walked again. I'm not saying this is a miracle, because it won't work for everyone. But in this case, it worked. In this case, the nerves that were not supposed to communicate again just gathered again and just made these men walk again. We can change one's paradigm. Virtual reality is used to help reduce racial biases, help with anorexia, another example, and much more. It plays with our complex and fragile sense of identity. <coughs> To demonstrate the power of virtual identities over our real social behavior, let me tell you the story of a bad boy. I call it the hot chocolate a la Voldemort. It's a scientific trial led by University of Villino, and you are asked to play whether Voldemort, whether Superman, or whether a neutral hero, which is just a ball. And after five minutes of fighting each other, you will be asked to realize a hot chocolate for the next participants. And you will have to put inside chocolate and chili sauce. But you have to decide how much of each of them you want to put into your beverage. And what they realized is that people who played Superman, they were putting more chocolates and way less chili sauce in the hot chocolate than people who played Voldemort. Behavior is context sensitive and the mind is very plastic. So is reality. In 2022, VR could be used by 256 million people. 
for various people, for vi various purposes, sorry, of course, for fun. But also it could be used for political messages, religious messages, marketing, etc. As we know that by only mixing 5% of your face on the face of a politician, you will be more willing to vote for him. What will it be like to expose yourself to a politic message within virtual reality where you can manipulate the image very easily? As we say, with great power comes great responsibilities. Going from storytelling to story living will have a price. We could be more into alternative facts than ever before, spreading easily the proofs of our beliefs. This is the Cottingley's Ferry case. It's back in 1917. And this is a case that was studied by two little girls that just borrowed the camera of their father. And they took this photograph and five, it was a total of five photographs. And what you can see is fairies. And at that time, it made a big case because people were very into spiritism and fairies and gnomes and etc. And when they saw the pictures, they believed they were true. Of course, some people believed they were not true. But this case went on for 60 years before the two girls admitted it was a montage. So during that time, confusion was powerful enough to lead some people to believe in fairies. These two girls, they had access to one of the most powerful technology at the time. It was photography. As we say, I will believe it when I see it. Fake news are sexier than reality. And our time is about to make us believe facts does no longer exist or matter. Too much confusion, too many contradictory information, so many opinions. Fake news play on this. It's an easy recipe, actually. Opinions are what matter. Share your opinion, share it high on emotion, whatever it may be especially if you can make a good amount of money with it, right? I would like to name a famous fake news, and this one is not about the last latest American elections. Let me rather give you a French anecdote, and it's an old one. I will, I will translate it for you. What you can read it will appeared in L'Intransigeant, a French, um, a French journal, in 1914. What it says is that enemies' projectiles are inefficient. The bombs explode into an inoffensive, inoffensive rain and about the German bullets. They go through our bodies without causing any harm. We used to believe it. Because in troubled times, we really wanted to hear that our husbands or sons were out of danger. And so we heard it. Fake news and social manipulation are new. Sure you knew that. But what we don't know, what we don't know yet is how we will be able to differentiate a lie from a truth in the times to come. This is video of Obama. Who have seen this case before? A few, okay. So, it has been created by University of Washington. This is a real Obama, this is a fake Obama. What they did is that they created an artificial intelligence that watched millions of videos of Obama and listened to it. And after a while, they were able to construct a fake video of Obama. And you can make Obama say anything you want. It's pretty simple. You just have to decide that with this algorithm, this is a mouse, and it's gonna move the way you want it to move. So we have a duty of care. A tool is just a tool. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Artificial intelligence, for example, is also used to tackle the problem of fake news, for example. 
There are so many beautiful stories awaiting to be told. And we are not alone to tell them. There are phones out there to help people interested in VR for good. For example, there is VR for Impact, created this year by HTC Vive, and that is supported by the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are an initiative from the United Nations, created in 2050, and they have 17 goals from ending poverty to ending hunger or even armed conflict. And they want to resolve all these problems within 15 years. 15 years, it's not a lot, but it's quite a time. So we can take this time to our advantage and we can see who can be our allies on this way. But we could talk for hours about the incredible applications of virtual reality already out there. What I would like to say is that a more precious resource is attention. In 2025, if we believe a Goldman Sachs study, the oil market could grow to 80 billion dollars. And I believe that today, more than ever, one dollar, one vote is a true statement. The attention you will pour into a cause, the dollars you will pull into a cause, will, determine, will determinate the future of our cultural area. Facts, demonstrable facts, scientific facts, scientific facts, they still exist. We must not forget that. Our most precious resource is attention, and there is so many inspiring stories left to tell. May virtual reality be your servant and not your master. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Naomi. Thanks. Let us get ready for questions. Naomi is an anthropologist, a journalist, and her perspective. She is a journalist, an anthropologist, and her perspective with regards to virtual reality is that it might help us in different fields. And you work in an institute. You have a, a research place, right? Where do you do your research? How do you organize it? OK, so last year, I've been invited to co-create a laboratory in innovation based in Paris for multinational startups. And so what I've been doing there is to launch different innovative uh, lines in virtual reality, but also in augmented reality and artificial intelligence. And so in this laboratory, I was uh, leading some innovation lines. And then I decided to leave, actually, this laboratory to be freelance and to do consulting and to join other line of research that I was not involved into. Because the, um, actually, the startup was opening in China and focusing on video games. And as I wanted to spend my time in other areas, I just decided actually to conduct my investigations otherwise, with other ways. It is quite um, amazing to see the uses that this may have in health and the effect on the body. Is there any other research or data that you might have? I am very amazed by all of those experiences you told us about. Yes, um, especially with the health applications, there's lots of experiments that are really inspiring. We, we, we were talking about EEG, and those have a particular future for me. Um, I was experimenting with those, actually, uh, for a video games that you can control with your mind. And what was astonishing to me is that after playing it only for 40 minutes, I was able to, because just 
to tell you how it was working. It's uh, listening to your brain waves, and when you are in a focus state, you make things levitate around you. And after only playing with it for 40 minutes, I was able to remember the taste of this focus, and I was able to apply it to real reality, to stay focused when I talk to people, when I do things. And um, there are actually experiments that have been conducted around this in the, in the around 2000, I don't remember exactly the date. And it was interesting because it has shown that with those neurofeedback in virtual, within virtual reality, uh, you can treat ADHD, so hyperactivity, better than with medications, for example. Um, so, for me, those applications of virtual reality with the brain, it's really interesting because you can probably, you can probably change the way we address mental problems or physical problems and um, forget about medications and try new things through this, uh, through this technology. Impactante. Bueno, vamos Very a a amazing. Eh, a ver si hay alguien que quiere Does anybody want to ask a question? A Como siempre, arrancamos tímidos. Piensen, sí, se deciden. Se están saludando, están levantando la mano, se están saludando. Are you saying hello to each other sí, or are you raising ayuda. your hand? Oh, there's somebody there to ask a question. Hello. My question is the next. Um, all these uh, new waves of technology are going to change uh, the journalism? Yes, so your question is how this technology could change journalism, right? Yes, um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, actually, we, we, we are about to really give a chance to people to be where it happens. It's going to be interesting, but also it's going to be a responsibility because what do you show? What do you hide? For example, if there's a bombing, if there's a terrorist attack, and you put a 360 camera there, uh, would you like to show everything to your audience, or would you like to hide something that are unbearable to some of us? You know, or do you take this to your advantage and say, okay, we're going to show everything, but with the help of language, we're going to explain everything that's around this scene that is really shocking. Because you can, you can shock people, you can traumatize people in virtual reality. But if you take this to, as an opportunity and say, OK, it's going to be shocking, but we can explain. And so you can go through the, protest, through the process of this traumatizing event without being, you know, without having a PTSD or, or some sort of that after. It's going to be very interesting to see how we choose to show things and what, how will our responsibility as journalists evolve through this media. But also my question that I raised in the presentation is about the security of the truth. How do you demonstrate that what you were filming were true? If now we can make say anything to Obama at any moment, you know, how it's going to be like to have fake truths, um, fake news around politicians or people or around celebs, or around intellectuals. This is the questions that I have in the back of my mind quite every day with these technologies around. Bien, acá, adelante, primera fila. Somebody here in the acá first row. Tengo una pregunta. I have a question. No, I mean, uh, going back to the fake news thing and the Obama experiment, maybe we can, if you, we know a little bit about it, we'll be able to find out whether it's fake or true. But they, everybody, people won't know that. So let's see, we have channels that continually broadcast fake news using that technology. What would people say? How can, how can they know this is true, this is fact? Okay, so one of the possibilities is to use uh, artificial intelligence to watch after fake news. Uh, for example, I know of a French initiative and they watch Twitter's news and they try to cross information to be sure it's a real video or it's a fake. Um, for example, they will look at how many people shared it, uh, when it was taken, is it really close to the environment it was taken, it was supposed to, 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 show, to show, okay? So, uh, my guess would be that virtual reality can be watched 
by artificial intelligence. But for now, it doesn't exist. So yes, how we will know? We will know if people are concerned by that and they want to put their talent, talent and attention and resources into that question. Ahora sí, perdón, perdón, eh. Sí, no hay, acá. I wanted to know if there is a platform that re reunites everything to do with the health experimentations and if it is open source. Yes, um, definitely you can join the community I've created. It's called Virtuality for Reality. It's open online, it's on Facebook. And the aim of this community is to share the applications of virtual reality for education, health, rehabilitation, etc. So we are focused on this question since more than a year, one year and a half. And you have a lot of informations that go there. It can be news, but it's most of them it's about scientific papers we share, just to spread the knowledge around it. Muchas gracias. Bien. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Any other questions? No. Por acá. I wanted to know if you've done any kind of research with regards of how uh, the viewers' brains are affected by fiction in virtual reality. Um, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, actually, the brain is... Okay, so how to answer to that? Like, whether it's fictional or non-fictional, your brain will likely respond in the same way to it. At at least if it's not too away from reality, which is interesting. It's a different point. But um, so we know, we know from studies on rodents, actually, that the brain reacts totally differently within virtual reality than within reality. We know that the brain waves patterns are very new and different when you are watching virtual reality. But we don't know yet what it means. We just know that it's more hectic more active, more theta waves means probably more, you are more into the thing, but we don't know yet what it will provide to our brain or will do to our brain in the future users, the users that do it daily or a lot. So for the Memento study about the, the fiction, if we can go back to, to the fictional part of your question, um, we don't know yet, but you, we know already that uh, you can induce false memories uh, in early childhood with virtual reality. So you can make believe to someone that something fictional is real, definitely. And it's pretty much all really about uh, fictional. But for example, if you see yourself as a character, as a virtual character within virtual reality is going to influence your behavior in real reality. Um, for example, I was talking earlier about this hot chocolate and chili sauce, you know. So you can induce pro-social or anti-social behaviors once you are back into reality. You can trick the brain. Um, there is another study, for example, you are, um, you are playing either Superman or is there a random person in a helicopter and your duty is to find a diabetic children, okay? And so if you fly to the children, you feel uh, more concerned, more empowered than if you are in the helicopter just asked to look by the window, you know? So what they saw is that after this experiment, when they go back to reality, you see more pro-social behaviors when you played Superman and you were active than when you were just looking by the window. So we can trick yourself and your behaviors as well, um, depending on the story and depending if you are acting yourself or not, if you are a passive passenger of the, the experience. Um. Cuando when we were preparing this conference, Skype, in some of our Skype conversations, you told me that la the experience, the oniric dream experience, has a 
a point that is similar or the same as using virtual reality, that for the human brain, virtual reality experiences can have the same value as a dream. And we learned through psychoanalysis that dreams have a value within our psyche, which is quite special. Can virtual reality also articulate with the psyche such as the dreams do? Can it generate memories for things that did not happen, like you just said? Can it uh, work with our psyche in a special way? Are there any experiments done in this way? Okay, so more than just looking like a dream, it looks like reality. For, for the brain, actually. This is the reason why you can traumatize people uh, within virtual reality. For example, uh, I don't know if you have seen images of the last um, Resident Evil 7 on PSVR. Okay, when you play first person hero and you are lost in a haunted house and there's all sorts of you know, um, nasty souls that try to kill yourself and you have to protect yourself. And what you see from a first person perspective is, for example, a girl with a knife that jumps on you and try, you know, to take your life. And this can be profoundly traumatizing because anyone who has ever been attacked in the streets can have nightmares of it for years, you know. And so it's exactly the same in virtual reality because when you are in 360, you cannot just you know, jump out of it. Um, you cannot just look out of your 2D screen when you are looking at a, ho a horror movie, for example. It's easy to just you know, like look at your hands and like, oh, oh okay, no, I'm not here. You know, yeah. In virtual reality, it's not happening. It's not happening, definitely. You are into the thing. And if you do not remove your headset and your earbuds, you are still into the scene with this person attacking you. So it's way more intense. And yes, you can induce fake memories in children. Pretty sure we can induce fake memories in adults too, because I don't know if you heard about this uh, scientist. She is an American girl, and she's working about false memories and how you can convince people they have done something wrong but they never did, for example. She proved that in three days, you can convince someone that he killed another person. And he has no memory of that, but the third day, they will give every details that the scientist gave in the first place. Because you enter this, the place and she say, okay, do you have something special to, to tell me? And she acts like a psychologist and he say, no, I don't really know. And she's like, okay, because one of your friends told me that something went wrong and happened on this day, etc. And she sees him the other day, the day after. And you still don't remember a thing. Yes, because in, in between yesterday and today, I ha we had your parents coming into to testimony against you. And she gives more and more details. And the third day, the person thinks he's just crazy and he forget about that so he will testimony against himself in this case so the you know virtual reality is just an application of technology but the way we interact with our environment is powerful uh, enough yet to conduct to false memories and false testimony and etc so it's interesting to see virtual reality just as uh, a pretext to study the human behaviors and what we really are and how we function, how we are wired. Wow, me asustó un poco. No? Sorry about that. It scared me a bit. It scared me a bit. Uh, can, can you convey a final happy message? <laughs> uh, yes, of course. No, sorry. There's, as I told you, there's a lot of beautiful story to be told in virtual reality. For example, yeah. No, really, I'm gonna give you some before we leave. Okay. Um, for example, you, you take you take old uh, people, okay, who wanted to travel. I can't travel anymore. And you give them a headset and you give them a tour, a world tour. Okay, you can you can take them to the Caribbean, you can take them to a place they've known before and they can live again uh, in the neighborhood okay. of their childhood again. Okay, Things like in that. Definitive. 
Está it's muy not, bien, it's gracias. Not all gracias, <laughs> gracias, Naomi, gracias, gracias. Thank you, thank you. Es interesante ver que anyway, la, la creación de nuevas tecnologías. Anyway, it's interesting to see eh, that the, Nobel, the development no? of new technologies, uh, for example, de novel, depends on how it is applied, eh, how it is used. Tenemos una herramienta nueva. We have a new tool. And we need to examine all its possibilities, its outreach, and as we say again and again, and I said it yesterday, we are living uh, times in which new technologies have no uh, rules yet. Uh, the traffic lights were invented after cars uh, crashed into each other. Then the rules were applied. So we need to come up with new traffic lights because we don't have them, even for most Mobiles, we are disrespecting each other all the time, so there are dangerous and sensitive issues that will need to be regulated. It has been fascinating. Let us give her a round of applause. You have given a different outlook. Thank you very much. The problem with these meetings is that one would like to stay for hours, but there's lots of interesting people, and this is lunch break. Thank you for being Buenos Aires. Thank you for having invited you and brought you here. Thank you.